Hello, I'm the Nostalgia Critic. I remember it so you don't have to. And I'm a ghost. Yeah, I'm a ghost. Strangest thing. I died last week watching Ghost Dad. You would have done the same. But if there's anything that this movie has taught me is that death is no reason to stop working. Just keep going on with your everyday life and comedic possibilities will fall in your lap. Sarsaparilla good that of more any got you friends. Hey say. Malcolm, while I'm doing my review, could you do that outside? Why am I doing this again? I told you, it's the only way to continue seeing and hearing me as a ghost. But why? There's no rhyme or reason to it. I don't know, it just is. Now go back to doing jumping jacks dressed as Gandalf the Grey while reciting the dialogue to Big Lebowski backwards. Jasperilla, good rain. And why do I have to be dressed as sexy Dorothy while wearing a sombrero? Why is there even a sexy Dorothy costume? Who the fuck is turned on by sexy Dorothy? I didn't make up the nonsensical rules of the afterlife. I just know that if you two stop doing that, I'll disappear, the review will be over, and both of you will be out of a job. Got it? <sighs> this is a bunch of bullshit. Up, 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 in your Dorothy voice. Golly gee, Mr. Critic, this sure is a lot of bullshit! It's but a small price to pay to be in the world of the living. Now away with you, the dead grieve at your presence. I thought I'd like him better dead. Dorothy voice! I thought I'd like him better dead! <sighs> yes, there's a lot of crazy rules about the afterlife that apparently we didn't know about, but that was sort of the thing in movies for a while. The same way vampires and zombies has kind of been popular in media recently, ghosts were really popular in the late 80s and early 90s, presumably starting with the popularity of Ghostbusters. After that little blockbuster, suddenly every movie had a spook specter or ghost in it, all connecting with either a quirky afterlife, a bizarre haunting, or just about anything with comedic possibilities. Well, another thing the late 80s and early 90s liked to do was combine stuff. Yeah, because we clearly don't do that nowadays, of course. Enter Bill Cosby, who at the time had the number one TV spot with The Cosby Show for years. He was clean, he was friendly, he was a good role model, and he made everybody laugh. That is, on television. His movie career continued to tank with bomb after bomb as Hollywood seemed to be hinting that unless Cosby can pull off a successful film with the next one, they were going to yank him as a main star of the big screen and keep him a main star of the little screen for the rest of his life. What followed was a movie career dangling on the edge, knocked over by a spitball of deafening silence where there should have been laughter. This is that spitball. Directed by Sidney Poitier. Yes, that's Sidney Poitier. They call me Mr. Tibbs. They'll be calling you much worse after they see this film. Ghost Dad is a fascinating experiment to see if two successful people re-entering two unsuccessful fields can somehow produce a successful... not this. The answer, of course, is too painful to sit through, too painful to talk about, and too tempting not to have me be in pain over. So let's take a look at the final nail in the coffin that really did make Cosby's movie career a ghost. This is Ghost Dad. We see Cosby in the very familiar position that most comedic dads are in, not having enough time for his kids because he's too busy being not funny. With his wife having passed away from Get the Bitch Out of the Film Isis, Cosby finds he has to cut corners by having a recording of himself read his kids a bedtime story. Okay, honey bun, that's enough for tonight. I had to work late again this weekend. Now, make me louder, hold me up to the door. Good night, Diane. Don't wait up for me. I never do. You know, if he's so damn busy with his job and all, how did he have time to record all this? Couldn't you have spent that time making the recording to be with your kids instead? Daddy, can you come play with me? I'm sorry, Bun Bop, but I gotta do this recording to make up for the fact that I can't spend time with you. You know, it's thinking like that that made you do Leonard sick. I thought we agreed never to mention that movie in this house. Things don't get much better when he forgets his oldest daughter's birthday, so he puts shaving cream and a candle on a hat. That ought to solve the problem. My father on my ninth birthday dressed up in a bunny costume for a whole week. A whole week? A whole week because the zipper stuck. You know, he didn't mean to do it, so he had to bump around the house because he made it like a bunny for a whole week. <laughs> well, I'll give this movie this. I do legitimately want to see him dead. You forgot. You completely forgot, Bucko. Admit it. If everything goes the way I think, the company is also going to give me a car. And if they do, you can have Grumpy. 
Really? Yes. Really? Yes. Oh, Daddy, can I drive it today? Oh, please, I promise I'll be incredibly careful. Thursday. Ellen, I will take you to work. Diana. I'll take you oh, Wow, that must be quite the car that she's excited about. Quite the incredible, awesome piece of shit Clark Griswold mobile you've ever seen in your life. Hey, maybe next week he'll let you cruise around in that hot rotting minivan. You know the one with two entire horsepowers in it? I was thoughtful. Well, how are you, Stuart? And from here, Cosby takes a merry stroll down nerdy stereotype lane. Yes, because this movie is too lazy to steal from other stereotypes, it focuses instead on just one. The 80s nerd, and all the incarnations that this decade pushed out with it. You got the Urkel nerd, the secretary nerd, the old relic nerd, and of course, the businessmen nerds. And for a comedian who enforced that any person of any color can be in any position, there sure does seem to be a lot of crusty old white guys running things, aren't there? Gentlemen, you all know Elliot Hopper, huh? Oh yeah, a black one. Gets you tickling Mr. Nero's wife in Macy's window. All bets are off. <laughs> <laughs> but things go awry when he steps into a cab driven by a crazy cab driver. Going a little fast, aren't we? Hey, shouldn't you be salting sidewalks across from the McAllister's house? The road is that way. <laughs> Ten crazy minutes to, oh my god, am I ghost dad? Oh, no, 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 no. There is no way I'm starring in this horse crap. No, no, I'm out. I'm gone. I'm gone. Fuck my contract. I don't care. I give you $20 to stop. I give you 40 I've got $76. All you have to do is stop the cab. Hey, come on. You're driving so fast, you nearly lost the giant screen projection behind us. Do you accept the Lord Satan as a supreme being? So it looks like the cab driver is a crazy Satanist. Typical? As Cosby convinces him that he is Satan himself. Doubly typical? And convinces him to pull the cab over. But just as he sees why white people should never drive cabs, he opens the car door, plunging into the river. He makes his way back up to find that nobody can see him and apparently nobody can touch him either. This, of course, means he comes to a horrible realization. I'm not dead. I know. I know I'm not dead. This is... I'm dreaming. I gotta wake up. Wake up. Wake up. I'm not dead. I gotta get out of this dream. That's right. He's not very funny in a movie on his own and desperately needs kids to work off of. Hi, Dad. Hi, Dad. What? Hi, Daddy. You can see me? What? You can see me! My mouth is moving, but I can't hear anything. But in a strange combination of rules, Cosby finds that people can see him in the dark, but not in the light. And on top of that, they can't hear him even though he can hear himself. You can't hear me, but you can see me. You can't hear me, but I can hear myself. Also, if he concentrates, he can touch stuff, but if he doesn't, things float right through him. And if he doesn't keep focus, his voice doesn't match up with his body. This name's And what else, what else? Uh, you don't put him in daylight, you don't get him wet, and you don't feed him after midnight. Daddy, are you going to go away like Mommy did? No, honey. I'll smack on a while. I'm staying right here, okay? You know... It's funny how this ghost movie is supposed to be funny, but in a strange way, it's actually kind of creepier than scary ghost movies. Couldn't you just hear this creepy audio being listened in something like The Exorcist? Oh, it burns! Yeah, so it... No, honey! Help, my God! I don't know why. Mom, you know how the kids love jello pudding, and you know it's made with fresh milk, so it's wholesome. But Cosby, it appears, is being sucked into another location via not very well hidden crane lift. What? Oh my god! Remember me for my inaudible gibberish! He gets transported to a genetically spliced version of Rowdy McDowell and the Dos X's guy, who's a scientist that puts metal things on his fingers to sync up his audio. Why would that help sync up his audio? Cause of death? I drown in a taxi cab. He then gives him a beaker of purple liquid and looks at a compass. I 
don't know why he's doing that either. You know, for a scientist, his answer to anything afterlife related is, it just is. What am I doing? So, this movie clearly thinks that if Cosby plays his role as a broken Disney animatronic, somehow that'll get a laugh. Which, if it was in Disney World, it would. But here, it's just the death of comedy. They screwed up. It's the afterlife equivalent to misplacing your paperwork. It's rare, but it happens. Anyway, it's a sort of speciality of mine. You know, I've written a book on it, actually. Intercorporeal Maltransference. I'm the world's foremost authority on life after death. This is why I'm in no way going to contact anybody about the absolute proof that there's life after death, but instead partake in a depressingly unfunny dialogue about having a girl's name. In the book, it's spelled Edith. But it's pronounced Edith. What's the girl's name? Edith is a boy's name. Who are you named after? I was named after my grandmama. And they called her Edith? No, her name is Edith. So you see, it is a girl's name. No, it's not! Stand still! Maybe if we yell louder, this will somehow be funny! Nope! Then why are we still doing it? No! I want you to send me back! Alright! So he sends him back to his family via lightsaber sound effects. Yeah, because nobody would recognize that sound. And he tries to figure out what to do next. How am I going to go to work? Wait a minute. Seriously? Seriously? You know, call me kooky, but I think being dead can at least warrant one day off. But the actual reason does make a little bit more sense. In the same way that sitting on a lamp somehow makes sense. What? You see, he didn't get any life insurance, and he wants to make sure his kids are financially secured before he goes. How am I going to support myself and two kids? Why did you leave everything to the last minute? If he can go into work as usual and get the merger to go through okay, a ton of money will be given to him that he can pass on to his kids, making sure that they'll be okay. But, um, have you considered this other possibility? Show everyone that you're a fucking ghost and make goddamn millions off of it? I mean, if you told that scientist, or hell, any scientist, that you'll let him study you if you donate said shit ton of money, I think they would fucking do it. But no, it makes much more logical sense just to go into work as usual and have his kids turn off the light so that he can talk to people. No suspicion there. What are they doing? Uh, they're shutting out the light. And even that doesn't make sense, seeing how there's clearly scenes where you can see light touching him over and over again. I mean, Jesus Christ, he's in the lit doorway! Shouldn't half of his face be gone or something? I'm talking about the fact that I want to concentrate and the view in the sunshine, it's distracting. Okay, I'll buy that one. Though nothing in the script has given me reason to, as an actress, I just decide to give up. You have to take your life insurance physical this afternoon. So the doctor, of course in the dark, because when has a doctor ever needed light, tries listening for his heartbeat. <sighs> hmm. hmm, sounds a bit tinny, not much bass, and a lot of treble, but aside from that, fine. <laughs> Oops, almost forgot the easily excitable nerd. Woo! He's got him rolling in the aisles on Nick Jr. He uses a replica of Kira Knightley to fake the x-ray, and all that's left is the urine sample. Oh, give me a minute. <laughs> Why did she laugh at that? Do they usually watch when a urine sample is done? Oh, give me a minute. <laughs> oh, ho, ho, I have some issues. Some sick, creepy, authority alerting issues. So he sneaks in to steal some of Dana Carvey as Turtle Man's urine for the same test, because apparently he never looks down to aim when he does this kind of stuff. <laughs> because this is what you think of when you think of a kid's comedy, a creepy shirtless guy's hand getting disturbingly close to an old guy's junk in the middle of a bathroom urinal. A family picture. 